Jackson, we're having trouble hearing you again, honey. Well, this might be the perfect opportunity for me to jump in since that's where we were going to end the, uh, the tour anyway. <clears throat> Jackson, are you still with us? Thanks, he is. <laughs> Feel like I'm back in my TV days doing a live shot here. Um, I do want to just mention to my students, Captain, this great room, it's absolutely magnificent. It's absolutely a magnificent <clears throat> room and surrounded by windows. So you get this incredible view of the ocean. It, right now, you get this incredible view. Yeah, right now, you get this incredible view of Newport Harbor. It's a really beautiful, uh, beautiful room. Uh, Jackson, yeah, can you hear you. me? Um, I just muted his microphone. Uh, uh, Captain Jonathan, take over. All right. Well, the first thing is everybody gets an IOU to come check out the great cabin where we were hoping to do this a few weeks back. But uh, it just gives you an excuse to come check out the ship uh, down the road when hopefully we're all back in Newport sometime in the not so distant future. Thank you. So just be before we sort of dive into what we're here to talk about, creativity, innovation, do folks have questions about the ship that we can answer for you? Sort of a lot to take in. Uh, sure. Um, you said that, well, my teacher said that uh, everybody who goes on your ship becomes part of your crew, right? Um, so, like, where are the jobs that you give people? <clears throat> sure. And, so, uh, Like, how do you decide who does what job and stuff, too? Sure. So one of the things about an experience at sea, especially on a training ship, is that it's a very structured regimen. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in depth. But the idea is to give people an entry level set of skills, have them perform those skills. And if they do that job well, they get a better job. Um, there's a really inspiring uh, movie about life at sea. Um, you may have heard of it. It's called Captain Ron. Uh, it's great comedy made in the in the late 80s with Martin Short and uh, Kurt Russell. But there's a great quote, which is that, you know, you do that job well, you get a better job. You go from swab to mate. And the idea is, is that, you know, ships in, in many respects, are well-run ships are often meritocracies. We promote and we recognize skill development and we give people new opportunities to push their own boundaries, especially on training ships. So everybody comes on board and has to have a baseline of familiarization. So just to, to give you an example and, and dive in a little bit to what Jackson was talking about, um, we're going to jump up here. And can you all see the, the safety plan that's up on the screen? I'll take a nod from a couple people just to make sure that we can see it. Great. <clears throat> so this is one of the, the diagrams that Jackson was talking about. And this one in particular is our ventilation system. And you might say, well, why do I need to know about ventilation? Well, in the event that there's a fire on board, one of the things that we want to do is cut off the air supply to that fire. So it's imperative that everybody knows how to do that and where the dampers or valves are that we can shut down airflow. So everybody that comes on board gets a baseline familiarization and then after that, we slowly train you for particular sets of skills. Uh, traditionally, we would say you'd have to learn to hand reef and steer or be able to steer the ship, be able to handle sails, and be able to sort of work in the rigging. And, and we start with those sort of elementary level skill sets, and then we add on navigation, and then whatever else it might be doing that the ship uh, is involved with. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Any other questions about the ship? Let's, let's... A question. I have a question, Brian McDonald. I'm, uh, you know, a, a colleague of Myra's, but I'm into the, interested in the technology on board. I'm sure there's a lot of that. Um, I did see up at the captain's control panel. It looked like a couple of uh, control panels, maybe for audio and video, because that's what I'm interested in too as well. Uh, so, could you speak about kind of the technology and you know how things have been modernized on the ship? Sure. So there, it's a little bit of a misnomer because there was nothing that was modernized on the ship because she is a modern ship. So the ship was commissioned in 2015. Uh, the only thing that's really historic about her is what she's built to represent. So her sailing rig, her her visual appearance is, is very anachronistic, but she's a 
modern vessel. And with that, you know, from our navigation systems, we have two radars. We have uh, something called AIS or automatic identification system. And that's a way that ships can communicate with each other through VHF radio uh, and data to say, okay, this is this ship. Uh, it gives us the name, how far away it is, what the likelihood of a collision would be your closest point of approach. We have uh, the capability of depth sounding. We have satellite communications. And that's just sort of our navigation and operation suite of technology. Then on board, we have a full wireless network with the capability of latch point connection either to a cellular network for data, to a satellite network for data, or to Wi Fi that's on the dock. Uh, we have you know, internal communication systems, and then there's hydraulics and water systems and propulsion systems. So she's, uh, she has a lot of equipment and gear on board. I wouldn't say it's necessarily very complex. It's pretty common for a modern ship of her size, but there's a lot of it on board. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Any other questions? Well, I'm going to start off with asking you a bunch of questions, but I wanted to share with you a couple images here just to sort of, I said, get, get our, our thoughts going. And the first one, if I can pull it up here. So just to give everybody an idea, that's what the ship looks like underway. And there's some 20 odd sails that we can set in different combinations. And we'll just scroll through some pictures here. Um, a, a pretty sort of awe inspiring platform. And I share that with you because going to sea on a square rig ship is absolutely nothing new. And you might ask yourself, well, what does this have to do with creativity or innovation? And I would say that the environment that we create on a ship at sea, whether it's a modern ship, whether it's a historic ship, whether it's a modern ship built to look like a historic ship, are relatively all the same. And there are certain value sets or value propositions that we leverage. And that in turn creates a very particular environment that is absolutely ripe for creativity and innovation. So just to prove my point to you, I wanted to share with you a passage, which is the opening paragraph of Moby Dick, because I think it sort of sums up for many people why in particular they've gone to sea to sort of shake off the cobwebs. So <clears throat> indulge me as I read to you for a moment. Perhaps close your eyes and take it all in. Call me Ishmael. Some years ago, never mind how long precisely, having little or no money in my purse and nothing particular to interest me on shore, I thought I would sail about a little and see the watery part of the world. It is a way I have of driving off the spleen and regulating the circulation. Whenever I find myself growing grim about the mouth, Whenever it is a damp, drizzly November in my soul, whenever I find myself involuntarily pausing before coffin warehouses and bringing up the rear of every funeral I meet, and especially whenever my hypos get such an upper hand of me that it requires a strong moral principle to prevent me from deliberately stepping into the street and methodically knocking people's hats off, then I account it high time to get to sea as soon as I can. This is my substitute for pistol and ball. With a philosophical flourish, Cato throws himself upon his sword. I quietly take to the ship. There is nothing surprising in this. If they but knew it, almost all men in their degree, sometime or other, cherish verily nearly the same feelings toward the ocean with me. So I thought I would take a second to ask you, what's he talking about? That, of course, is Herman Melville in, in writing about his uh, character Ishmael in the beginning of the, the epic sea battle and narrative with Captain Ahab and the Great White Whale. But what is that paragraph all about? And what does it have to do with creativity and innovation? Hi, I'm Emily. Hi, Emily. Um, if I may speak. Um, to me, it sounds like the ocean is really just a way to um, kind of get some relief, I guess, in your life. If you're stressed, if you're um, if you're just worried about different things, I feel like it's, we all have our different like ways of um, 
like putting off stress, like people may go running, but it seems like the ocean is really just a way to draw people. And it's a good way to use that innovation in a way that makes you happy. Um, and to, to just put some purpose into something that you care about, I guess. Great. So Emily, you know, mentioned not just the ocean, but running. So what what's the analogy or what's the comparative between the ocean and going for a run? Oh, am I still speaking? <laughs> you can be or somebody else can chime in. Well, if no one else wants to chime in, I can okay. talk. <laughs> um, I mean, I guess it's uh, everything is similar in a way that um, like running. It's a way of having a, a singular point and going with it. So it's like, say I'm gonna run three miles and then you you get wet, work yourself up to that point. It's kind of the same thing where it's like, I'm gonna put my effort into working the ship and taking whatever challenges on in the ocean and whatever the, the weather is gonna be like and putting my effort into that because like running, that's what I like to do and that's how I feel the best. You know, it, it's interesting because you you brought up the goal of running, right? We we I have a goal of that three miles, and I'm going to psych myself up, and I'm going to get there. So I ask everybody: Is having a target the opposite of creating an opportunity to be creative or innovative? Anybody else want to chime in? Captain, can you, Captain, can you, um, can you repeat the question? It cut out for the last couple of words. Sure. So Emily was talking about the fact that, you know, when she goes for a run, you have a target, you have a goal of, let's say, I want to run three miles. So I, I'm curious, because one of the things that that says to me is that, you know, I have a targeted goal. Does that mean that I'm not allowing myself the opportunity to be creative or think differently? So I was just curious if anybody had a thought about that. you guys what do you think so, this is a this is a great opportunity for fun to watch the steam come out of the ears it's cool it's all right <laughs> what do you um what do you guys think about this what what is if i set a goal does that mean that i've i i can't be creative how would you bring creativity into that run if you were going to do that um well it's for me i feel like it's kind of harder um with an example like a run if it's something like you know, I want to get the lead in the play. Okay. You can take different steps and different paths to get there. Whereas with a run, it's kind of different. So like. Well, but, but think about with a run, right? If your goal is three miles, right? You can go in a lot of different directions. You could do the three miles in one big stretch. You could do some sprints and some jogs. You know, there are lots of ways to, to break it up. And I think that. You know, it's interesting to think about it from a, a creative standpoint is that just because you have a, a preconceived notion of what the outcome should be, it doesn't necessarily mean that the pathway to get there has to be the same or predetermined. There can be a lot of sort of choose your own adventure within that same goal. So I guess one of the things that I would share with everybody is that just because we're given an objective doesn't mean that we can't be really creative and innovative about the process to get there. But let's get back to sort of the ocean and the sea. And I think Emily really hit on it. One of the things is, you know, when we go for a run, by the very nature of going outside and going for a run, we're not doing that where we spend most of our time, right? We're in a different environment. So I would suggest to you that an environmental change might be something that really brings on creativity and innovation. So just by a show of hands, how many of you, when you're like stuck writing a paper, go for a walk? Okay, a couple of hands, or go get something to eat, or go play on the internet. <laughs> right. We we are changing something up. We're we're shaking up our our neural pathways and trying to create in ourselves something different that might inspire us in a different way. So it's it's not just Herman Melville who who thought the sea was a powerful sort of source of infrared. In, inspiration in a way to get away from the great things of shore or sort of the the drizzly November that sort of I think sometimes weighs us down when we're trying to be to think outside the box to use a cliche.
But, you know, look at, at our shared, you know, narrative Western society. We have, you know, Jason and the Argo. We have all of these adventures at sea. Um, and there are modern narratives that take place in, in contemporary times where sort of this, the story is the same. People go to sea to sort of escape what's trapping them, traipsing them down on land or trapping them down. But in particular, you know, going to sea as an adventure is very different than going to sea as a profession. And I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the things that we do aboard a ship that may seem very rigid in particular, but in turn, I would argue, really allow you to be creative and innovative. So um, I'm going to go back to that uh, diagram that we all looked at a minute ago, which sort of talks about our ventilation system, right? Pull it up here. Of course, he can't pull it up when he wants to. There we go. All right. <clears throat> so, you know, one, we have a pretty compelling visual here. It's easy to look at, and you start to look through it. And this is just a tool, but it, it's something that we really enforce that everybody starts to learn. Everybody has to learn these things. Everybody has to understand how to perform basic functions. It's something I, I talked about earlier when I forgot who it was, asked me about what it's like to be a crew member on board. So I share with you that one of those things that becomes really important in our world is universal understanding or a shared language. Now, one of the things that we have aboard a ship are lots of special words. I mean, there's things like baggy wrinkle and to gallant and forecastle and Oh, I don't know. There are a couple other interesting ones out there. Uh, coxcomb. Uh, and everything that, that is familiar all of a sudden takes on a different word. Like, we can't call it a bathroom. It's a head. It's not the kitchen. It's the galley. Why can't we call it a dining room? It's a mess. And there's a, a long history of how these terms and phrases evolved. But there's a unique language to us. And one of the things that we have to think about in the community that exists on board is that we all speak the common language. And sometimes it's easier to introduce everybody to a new language than to try to find the language that is most common to everybody else. So I would share with you another thought, which is that in a shared community, the potential for creativity and innovation is really predicated on a universal understanding to some degree. So more on that in a minute. So the other thing that we have to deal with aboard a ship are emergencies. How many of you, just out of curiosity, show of hands, have ever had to deal with a fire? One person. Okay, Myra. Uh, anybody ever have to deal with a medical emergency, helping you know, dealing with a heart attack or a broken leg or something like that? So. For that medical emergency, if one of you would share, so what did you do? What was your response? Fiona, you raised your hand, so I'll pick on you. You got to unmute yourself there. All right, go for it. Um, I, I don't know if I like, totally want to share. Cause... Okay. But you, you had a med you had to deal with a medical emergency, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So let me ask you a couple of pretty generic questions. Were you able? I mean, obviously you're here, so you dealt with the situation, right? Yeah. Did you stop doing whatever it was that you were doing to deal with the situation? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do you think on a ship we have the the ability to always stop, or do we still have to continue with the situation while it's happening? Probably not. You probably still have to like make sure that everyone else is safe. So that, like, right. Yeah, we have that challenge. We have that duality of purpose. Anybody else that might want to share with us sort of what, you know, they did in terms of dealing with a medical situation? Um, so, like, I had to go to the hospital. Okay. Right? Um, I don't know. It was, like, five minutes away. It was a drive. What's that? It was like a drive is five minutes away. Um, so you, whatever was going on, you, you stopped what you were doing and drove to the hospital? Yeah. All right. So again, right, you had the opportunity to sort of stop and redirect and do something else. On a ship, you know, we don't have that. So we have to think not only about 
the immediate task at hand, but how that task at hand fits into a broader circumstance. So aboard a ship, we like to give everybody very particular responsibilities. And the reason for that is because it's way easier to sort of have an action plan and utilize that plan in our response than it is to make it up as we go along. So the document I'm sharing with you right now is something that we call a, a station bill or a watch quarter station bill. And it basically gives everybody's initial emergency response on a ship. So you'll see at the top is the captain. And in every situation, you know, I have the easiest job to remember because it's the same thing for every situation. I'm pretty much in command uh, on the bridge, sort of coordinating the big picture response. And then if you work your way down, you might see the chief mate. That's the the first officer, the second in command, right? And they might be our on scene leader and they're gonna feed information back to me. And that way we're gonna develop our, our response to the particular situation based on the information we're getting. The engineer, they're going through their responsibilities. And if we look on down, everybody has a job and you might see that there's redundancy in those jobs, right? Because as we discussed before, we can't have single point failure on super critical things. We have to have, we have to make sure that we can take care of those things. If the one person who was supposed to do it is all of a sudden out of commission. So again, does any of this seem really creative? Not really, right? By a show of hands, how many people look at pre-planning emergency responses at, you know, aggressive training and memorizing, you know, emergency charts as being really creative and innovative? Anyone? Okay. I'm just curious why you think that. Because I certainly don't. And we can disagree. That's awesome. So was Sydney, would you mind sharing why you think that that's a, a pathway to creativity? Um, well, it. I think it is because you have to think of all these ways, um, like all the situations that can go wrong and plan out the best solution for each of those issues. And I feel like there's like so many possible ways you could do that. And there's a lot of trial and error. And you know, it might not look like it's really creative or innovative, but like I think the mechanics that go into making the plan are the ones like the things that do make it like creative. Yeah, absolutely. It might not be the plan itself. And yeah, Myra, go ahead. I'd like to jump in for one second. You know, Sydney, I love that thinking. I'm the same way. Um, one of the things that I really uh, appreciate is I love contingency planning. I think contingency planning is amazing. And so I think that for those of us who enjoy doing it, I, I just love the idea of taking a step back and thinking about every possibility. What could go wrong? What do we need to plan for? What equipment do we need to have? What what supplies do we need to have? Um, and in my work with uh, companies doing quality management, that's one of the things that we do is contingency planning so that you kind of anticipate what might go wrong so that you're prepared. So I see it as a creative endeavor, although, um, although Captain, I can understand why most people probably see it as just a sort of mundane, oh my God, we've got to do it, probably we'll never need it, but, if, if, but when you need it, you're sure glad you have those plans in place. My and interestingly, and, and you raise a couple great points, and, and Sydney hit the nail on the head. The document that we were just looking at, the station bill, is the end result of a really creative process. And that creative process is ship's drills. So for every emergency, we're required by law to go through a practice evolution. So we're required to do a man overboard drill once a month, and we're required to do weekly fire drills. And the idea is that you don't want those drills to be the same all the time. You don't want the same people doing the same job all the time. And at the end of those drills, two things should happen. One. Before you talk about it, you should put everything back where it belongs. So if you think back to when your mom or your dad or your grandparents used to yell at you to clean your room before you do the next thing, it's the same way in the real world. And the reason for that is because it's been demonstrated that if you move on to the next thing before you sort of put all your toys away, when there's an emergency, the toys aren't going to be or the tools or the response equipment isn't going to be where you need it because you forgot to do it. 
So a little helpful hint is clean up your mess first before you move on to the next thing. But when we go through these drills, the goal is to really be imaginative and creative as to what goes wrong, what went bad. There was a training ship that sunk off the coast of Brazil about 10 years ago now called the Concordia. And it was a gap year program with, with high school and college student aid, uh, aid students. And they were in a severe weather phenomenon called a uh, microburst. 40 students on board, no loss of life. And it was amazing because they had practiced and drilled and drilled and drilled. And when all of a sudden the walls were the ceiling and the ceiling was the floor, they had had enough experience knowing their ship intimately and practicing these drills that they, they, they went through it to the best of their abilities, but performed flawlessly. And I think that that is a testament to the power of practice, right? They say it takes 10,000 hours of practice to get to a level of mastery in general. And while they're not drilling for 10,000 hours, they spent a lot of time intimately knowing what their responses should be. But this document, this station bill, is a dynamic, living, breathing document. It's not something that everybody walks on board and you get assigned a job and we do. That's the starting place. And then we revisit it through drills and practice and we make modifications and we change it. And maybe this deckhand doesn't fit in the firefighting gear. So they're not a good person to go man a fire hose. Or this person spent 25 years as a firefighter. Maybe they should be on our fire response team. There's a value not only in having a pre-planned response, but in being dynamic enough to understand the value in different skill sets and bringing that to the betterment of our response. So I think that that's a really interesting sort of balance point between those two things. So again, within what first comes across as a very rigid sort of directive about how we do things on a ship is really all about being innovative and creative and just using it sort of as a starting point or a baseline. But it's the same thing with that three mile run. This station bill is our three miles. We know at the end of it that we want to get to this point. How we get there is really like a choose your own adventure book. So I want to talk a little bit more about what it takes to create the environment of creativity and innovation. And the way that we like to look at that aboard the Oliver Hazard Perry is really about the concept of resilient communities. So just to throw this out there for everybody, what does that mean when I say resilient communities? What does that mean to you? Come on, folks, what do you think? Resilient communities. What's what Captain talking about? What does it mean to be resilient? Go for it. Car Carly, right? Yep. What does it mean to be resilient? I think being resilient is being able to kind of handle anything that comes your way and not change your attitude and kind of stay strong. Yeah, I think that's a great definition. What we're doing right now, is that a demonstration of resiliency? I think so. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Both on the sort of in, in the microcosm of our little chat right now and also in the bigger picture of what we as society are doing, right? We're being responsive to the external stimuli or influences in our life, but we're still trying to get to that same end goal, right? You're still trying to get the credit in Myra's class. Uh, I'm still trying to teach a class, you know, and partner with Salve Regina University. We're just doing it in a different way, but we took the resources available to us to do that. Yeah, so resilient communities to us within our organization, let's say, are on the ship might mean an understanding of the environment that we're operating in, Right? So for us, it's it's the ocean, both in its physical sense and also its sort of metaphoric sense, right? Because that influences us deeply. It's about an understanding of the people that we bring together, our community, right? And it's about understanding how to affect great outcomes utilizing all those resources. So on shore to us, a resilient community might be one where people have a sustainable existence, right? Has anybody here ever heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs? No, yes. I'll give you the non-psychology major definition, which is that if you don't have a roof over your head and food on your table, you're not gonna be able to do very much else, right? We need shelter, we need clothing, we need to be safe. Once we know we're safe, then we can think about all these other things. If you think about that station bill, it's a mechanism to provide for our own safety. 
And most particularly what that station bill does is it takes us through a moment of sheer terror, right? Think about this. Someone's fallen overboard. There's a fire on your ship. There's a hole in the ship and we have to leave right now. And gives us a pathway to affect our own response, right? To bring about a positive outcome. If that's not resiliency, I don't know what is.